mean, I can think of Calling to order the Monday, February 3rd, 2020, regular meeting of the 38th Council of the City of Berkeley. Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the roll? Councilmember Baker? Here. Councilmember Blanchard? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Dean? Here. Councilmember Gavin? Here. Councilmember Hennan? Here. Councilmember Price? Here. Mayor Turbrack? First order of business is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? Madam Mayor Pro Tem, uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda with the following change, uh, removing item 11, closed session from the agenda. Okay. Second. Support by Council Member Baker. Okay. Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the roll? Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Dean? Yes. The agenda has been approved. Please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the pledge. With us today is Pastor Tal Sullivan. Let's pray. God, it's a privilege to come before you and to invoke your name and your blessing. God, in this meeting and over our city, over our public servants, over all of the residents and business owners, God, we do not want to live without your blessings. And so we ask that you would bless us here in Berkeley. Give us wisdom with decisions that are made. Give us uh, the ability to work with each other and to work through disagreements and difficulties in a way that is um, pleasing to you. And we ask, God, that this time tonight uh, would be honoring to you with the way we conduct ourselves. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Next is citizens' comments. You may present your thoughts on issues that are not included on tonight's agenda. Council members will not engage you in discussion. If your concern needs to be addressed by a member of city staff or a department of the city, please sign your name on the sheet provided at the clerk's table. You may speak on a specific agenda item when it is being considered. When you come to the microphone, please state your name and city of residence. Okay, seeing no citizens' comments, um, I'm gonna close that, and um, I would like to thank Andy Meisner for joining us here tonight, our county treasurer. Um, I'm sure there are things that you want the residents of Berkeley to know, and all of us here in attendance, we'd love to hear. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and distinguished members of the council. It's uh, good to be here, and I think this is my first visit, so since we've got some new faces, and uh, what a nice thing to see. Um, so uh, again, I'm Andy Meisner. I'm the county treasurer, Berkeley High School graduate, I guess is the uh, claim to fame that matters the most. Um, but I, I wanted to just briefly <coughs> share uh, a few items of uh, some urgency. Uh, the most urgent matter is that March 31st is the deadline for property tax foreclosure in Michigan. Uh, so we're trying to get the word out to as many folks as we can that if you know somebody or anybody watching you know somebody that could be uh, in uh, uh, tough financial straits uh, that now is the time to connect with the treasurer's office uh, we have resources that are available to help um, we've got a really friendly team and uh, we want to work to uh, solve any issues uh, which we can do through uh, a number of uh, resources um, one of the leave behinds is a, a fold over that describes the three year property tax foreclosure process in Michigan and uh, has also got some of the organizations that we work with uh, to assist folks with free financial counseling, uh, help with uh, credit repair, housing counseling, uh, work wrestling with their mortgage company if they're having challenges like that. Um, and then also uh, some small business counseling uh, as well. And I uh, want to thank uh, Councilman uh, Ross Gavin for his distinguished service in our office as a, a deputy treasurer for uh, 
How many years have you survived? Six. Wow. <laughs> He's coming. <laughs> Get this poor guy a drink or something. But, uh, uh, and so the uh, the flyers are left behind as well as my uh, business card, uh, but you know the the unemployment numbers are, are good nationally, but there are still a lot of people in our community that are being left behind, um, and a lot of people that are not participating in the economy as fully as we would like them to. Uh, a lot of times, it's just a question of connecting with the right resource, uh, right easy person to talk to, and work through some of their financial challenges. Uh, and so that's what we do through something at our office called the Financial Empowerment Center. Uh, and it's a free service available to everybody in Oakland County. Uh, the meetings are one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, they're discreet. Uh, and so it's just a place where you can talk with a professional about what's going on and get a game plan. Uh, whether, like I said, if it's a delinquent tax issue, uh, either getting on a payment plan or getting connected with something called the Step Forward Michigan Loan Rescue Program. And that's a program that's open right now that will pay up to $30,000 of somebody's mortgage and or property taxes if they are in a, a tough financial situation. Um, and we've helped over 1,000 families, I think it is, Councilman, uh, in Oakland County, uh, in communities just like Berkeley who have uh, just kind of fallen on hard times, uh, get this uh, kind of assistance uh, that has allowed, allowed them to maintain home ownership. Uh, and that's what the program is all about. Um, I did want to just briefly share some statistics for Berkeley. Uh, and, you know, I think as you well know, the Berkeley real estate market has recovered uh, from the recession uh, with uh, real gangbusters. Um, and Berkeley was never a hot spot for tax foreclosure during the recession. We had a little uptick here. Um, but I'm glad to say that uh, in years 2016 through 2018, there were zero tax foreclosures in Berkeley. Uh, there were two last year, um, and we currently have got uh, just one property on payment plan. Uh, we've got seven plans out there that we'd like to renew, uh, and uh, we're still trying to connect with six parcels. And so if, if that's a principal residence, in the next month or two, they're going to get a friendly knock at the door from their county treasurer and say, hey, uh, I want to give you an invitation to work with us to get through this challenge so that no property is lost. Um, and then just switching gears real quickly, I wanted to thank Berkeley for its participation in our local government investment pool. And uh, those are uh, local do dollars that we manage on behalf of uh, over 40 local governments in Oakland County. Uh, so that you don't have to maintain a full-time investment professional. Uh, city manager's got enough on his plate right now, as does the finance director. And so um, placing some funds with uh, our LGIP uh, has produced a uh, respectable uh, $36,064.40 uh, of alpha um, uh, or return that, uh, you know, pay, what is that, maybe a half of a police officer maybe, <laughs> or um, just a, a little bit to help out instead of just parking that money in an overnight money market. Uh, so some of the ways that we're partnering with the city of Berkeley, and we uh, appreciate your partnership and appreciate this community's leading the charge in Oakland County around making a great place to live and a uh, nice walkable downtown. And you guys have everything going on that uh, helps make Oakland County an even more special place. So thank you for that, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation and your service, not only to Berkeley, but to the county. Um, what are some of the outre other outreach mechanisms that, that you and your team are using to, uh, to get to folks? Um, it's hard to believe, but not everybody watches these city council meetings. <laughs> yeah. right? There's probably a few that you'll miss tonight. What are some of the other ways? No, you know, it's a, it's a great question, and especially as we get into this cell phone world and uh, things get so digital, um, you know, we've tried to go with that. And so in addition to some of the traditional methods like, you know, coming out tonight, um, you know, we also do uh, certified mail, uh, home visits. Uh, and then we've also started, uh, is it a texting program and uh, trying to reach people over the cell phone? Um, and, and we've actually, you know, jumped on social media, I think, from time to time if we've uh, had trouble, you know, connecting with somebody. Um, but, you know, it's such a kind of a digital age. 
uh, that we've tried to adapt government to uh, that speed of doing mm -hmm. things. And, um, and then you know, a lot of word of mouth as well through uh, local governments, houses of worship, uh, you know, that sort of thing. We'll, we'll go anywhere and do anything to prevent a foreclosure is our, is our MO. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for your efforts in, to that regard. Well, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for the question. And uh, my cell phone is still 421-ANDY. It's 248-421-ANDY, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's on the card. But uh, encourage anybody with any questions or if anybody wants to hear more about some of the resources that we talked about tonight, then I uh, would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for coming and sharing all this great information. And uh, we really appreciate your time. Okay. Well, thanks for your time. Yes. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Ms. Mitchell, will you please read the items on tonight's consent agenda? One, approval of the minutes. Matter of approving the minutes of the 38th Special City Council meeting on Thursday, January 23rd, 2020. Two, warrant. Matter of approving warrant number 1346. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Support. Okay, approved by Councilmember Blanchard with support from Councilmember Hennon. And are there any corrections or additions? Seeing none, Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the roll? Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. The consent agenda has passed. Moving on to the regular agenda. Ms. Mitchell, will you please read item number one on tonight's regular agenda? Recognitions presentations. Matter of any recognitions or presentations from the consent agenda. Seeing none, uh, we will move on to item number two, please. Presentation. Presentation by the Detroit Institute of Arts regarding the City of Berkeley's participation in the Inside Out 2020 program. Thank you, Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor for Tim. The, we're very excited this year that we were selected for uh, installations of several of the DIA's beautiful pieces of artwork uh, through their Inside Out program. So come this summer as people traverse uh, all the fa great things that Berkeley has to offer, uh, in addition to the, all of our regular great stuff, we'll also see pieces of artwork uh, provided throughout. So the, the DIA has uh, come here and graciously decided to give us an uh, update on all the great things going on. Excellent, thank you. And I believe we have Amanda Harrison Keeley. Yes, Sorry. No, that's okay. It's like the boys' names. <laughs> Honorable <laughs> Council Members uh, and Mayor Pro Tem, thank you so much sure. for having me here this evening. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. I know it's a full agenda tonight, so I'll move quickly. Um, as you've already mentioned, Berkeley has been selected to participate in our Inside Out project this year, and we also have another project going on in Berkeley. It's through our PIPA, which is Partners in Public Art Projects, and I will talk just a little bit about that, but I'd like to start with just what a national treasure the Detroit Institute of Arts is. I'm sure you're all familiar um, with the importance of our collection, but we're actually ranked in the top five encyclopedia. Uh, museums in North America and that's a very important distinguishment to make um, because we have some really important pieces in our collection. We were the home to the first Van Gogh to enter North America. Uh, you can see it up there is his self-portrait. We're also very well known for Di Diego Rivera's mural industry painting. Um, industry murals, excuse me, and uh, Bruegel's The Wedding Dance. This is a 500-year-old piece that's been riddled with controversy and also played a very important role during the Detroit bankruptcy um, for the DIA. And I think as of last week, we're very well known for Kermit the Frog, so I wanted to <laughs> include him in there as well. So I'll start by talking a little bit about Inside Out. We have several pieces that will be going throughout the community, and Dan Hill and I went through your town the other day, and he showed me all the highlight pieces, places to go. I think several pieces are going to go in the parks. We looked at the community center. We also considered the library. These are all still pending approval right now, but we're hoping to get artwork across the community with a mix of businesses and your, your public institutions. So we're excited for the Inside Out program because this is the first year that we're actually expanding it. So 
historically, like last year, for example, we had five installations throughout Oakland County. This year, we're excited to say that we have 11 in the different communities around Oakland County. And we've also expanded it to include indoor installations. So we have installations at DTW, if you ever go to their north terminal at the airport right now, and Secretary of State's throughout the Tri-County area as well. So we've also included new pieces of art, which I didn't want to show you yet because I'd give it away, but <laughs> we just wanted to say thank you for having us in your community for the Inside Out project. And also, uh, we met just er, last week, I believe, with members from Artisipate, and we've worked very closely with Debbie and a committee there to Debbie will of Artisipate will be sending out a survey. We're going to ask your community what type of art project they would like to see in Berkeley. That might be a mural adding to the beautiful collection I know you already have here in the community, or it could be a sculpture or some sort of public art that the DIA would work with Artisipate to help facilitate that project after we get feedback from your community members. So that will be moving along, and I'm sure you'll see renditions and concepts moving forward. We want to help cast capture the spirit of Berkeley um, in this artwork. So I'm excited to get the survey results back in for that, and then maybe you'll have us up for another update once we get more selections. Um, and I also wanted to let you guys know what's going on at the DIA right now. We have uh, Detroit Collects, a special exhibit. This is a collection of African American artists, all belonging to private collections that are on display right now at the DIA. And we also have Bruegel's The Wedding Dance Revealed. I talked a little bit about this painting earlier. Um, it really explores the science behind conservation. This is a 500-year-old piece, and it still looks fabulous. And the work and effort that our conservation department puts into maintaining it, as well as how pieces change along the years. So. Uh, if, if you're interested in that, I encourage you to come. These are free exhibits for you to enjoy right now. And then coming up, we'll have guests of honor, mm -hmm. Frida Kahlo and Salvador Dali just opening this week. Uh, people always ask, well, you have Rivera Diego. Where's your Kahlo? <laughs> so we're really excited to be having a piece by her or several pieces. And these will be accompanied by photographs from the industry mural uh, when it was being painted. So it'll be in conjunction with that. And then coming up in June, we have Van Gogh in America. This will have over 65 pieces of artwork from Van Gogh, including the self-portrait, which is in our permanent collection. And it's really a celebration of the fact that he was, um, we were the first in North America to have a Van Gogh painting, and we're very proud of that. Um, I wanted to mention that We've had 2 million visitors since 2012, and I'd love to credit all of our uh, free exhibits to this number, but it's really because in 2012, our Oakland County approved a millage, 0.2 mills, uh, to fund and offer free admission to anyone living in Oakland County, and that's really contributed to this number. Last year alone, we had 165,000 Oakland County residents come enjoy the DIA. We've also become a leader in education um, because of this. We've had 439,000 students since 2012. Last year from Oakland County, we had 22,000 students come through the DIA. This is on free field trips that includes bus transportation um, and a tour, usually a visual thinking strategies workshop, which really helps kids engage with the artwork. We've also offered um, VTS, the Visual Thinking Strategies workshops to our teachers within the schools. This helps build their communication and team work within the classroom. And we're actually expanding this project right now to reach uh, colleges and universities as well because it's been so popular. We've also been able to build really strong relationships with our senior communities. We offer Thursdays at the museum, which offers a bus trip to any group of 50 plus with 25 seniors or more wanting to come down. 
Um, and if on Thursdays from 1 to 3 o'clock, it always ends with a cookie and tea reception, which I think is everyone's favorite. <laughs> um, but we have for the program either a lecture, like Great Lakes Shipwrecks, March 12th. I included this because I thought maybe some people would be interested. It's a, a scuba diver, actually, who is one of the only ones to have dove the wrecks of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And he's going to be doing a lecture. And then participants will be invited to tour Michigan's Great Lakes. This is a photograph collection. The Great Lakes looking awfully calm in this photo, so kind of a contrast. But it's a fun exhibit that you are invited to walk through anytime. Really, it doesn't have to be for the program, but it was a nice tie-in for Thursdays at the museum. Last year, we had 89 senior groups come to the DIA for the Thursdays at the Museum program. This is exceeding our commitment to the county, which is at 60 right now. So we're not only exceeding our commitment to our county, but we're meeting de a demand that's there because people want to come and they have fun at these programs. And we really feel proud of the relationships we've built with these community, mem community members. Um, and then partners in public art. I wanted to just talk a little bit more about this. This is a mural that was done in Clarkston. Uh, last year we had one done in Clawson, and this year Berkeley was selected. You might not want a mural. It might come back as a sculpture. We'll see. But we're really excited to see what we can do to embody your community through this project. We also offer drop-in art-making workshops. So I know you have so many different events throughout the summer. If you wanted the DIA to come and be a part of that, we can do, we can facilitate art-making on the site. So it's a fun activity for families to enjoy. And then Inside Out, this is a uh, a project that I've already talked a little bit about, but this has been made po um, possible through that millage. And we've had 157 um, participating communities since 2012, and that's just growing so rapidly. Like I said, we've almost doubled in size this year to meet that demand. And none of this would be possible without our volunteers. I feel like the volunteer base at the DIA is really a core. We have six to 700 volunteers. 200 of those volunteers are all trained docents, so they are actually able to take you on tours throughout the DIA to touch on the highlights within that collection. And uh, those docents will also come to your community to offer a behind the scenes lecture. So if your library or your community center wants an educational lecture on I don't know, say Degas, we could come and do that and facilitate that for you. And that's because of our volunteers. So I just wanted to recognize them and the efforts that they, they include to make the DIA a really special place. Um, and just to recap, this is made possible with the millage that offers the free admission, free field trips, senior programming, and community partnerships. And I would be remiss to not mention that uh, we do have a millage vote coming up on March 10th. Uh, the language is to renew the existing millage that we have with you right now. So if you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, walking us through so many great uh, accomplishments and, and achievements that, that the uh, DIA has achieved um, recently. It's awesome. And uh, my wife and I will be there on Saturday for the Oscar nominated documentaries and we'll be renewing our membership. But uh, awesome. I actually did have a question in here. Please. If you could um, again recap the approximate time frame for the uh, Inside Out uh, in terms of decision making, when we approximately might see some installations and for how long will they be installed? Absolutely. So right now we have the contracts um, out with our partner, Dan, and I know he's working diligently to get those back to me February 7th. So once once I have those contracts returned, we place the frame order and get get things moving on our end so that way they'll be installed in May. Once we are closer to May and we know kind of what the weather is doing and a time frame, we'll give him exact details as to when and where we'll be in the community. Um, and that you'll see that in May and then they'll come down in November. So it's one installation, whereas in the past we've actually done two, a spring and the summer. This is just one, one time. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda, for coming and talking about this. It's really exciting. And just wanted to give a thanks to Dan as well for uh, really, you know, pushing this through in the application and everything like that and some uh, bugging from your friendly neighborhood councilman. So, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you.
Thank you so much. Okay, Appreciate you, you being here with us tonight. Okay, uh, Ms. Mitchell, please read number three on tonight's agenda. Motion number M820, manner of authorizing Stephen Siller Tunnel to Towers to conduct a 5K run on Sunday, October 4th, 2020, from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., beginning at Hurley Field at Anderson Middle School. During the event, representatives of the Stephen Siller Tunnel to Towers will provide volunteers to assist with the event. Is there a motion to approve M0820? So moved. Support. Councilmember <clears throat> Gavin with support from <clears throat> Councilmember Blanchard. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, your memo includes, uh, uh, or your packet includes a memo from our public safety director as well as route information, the copy of the event application, uh, this has been this event has been an absolute pleasure to to bring into the community. It's it's been going for several years now. Um, Tim and his team is always very well prepared, uh, as you'll see as reflected in this document here. Uh, and it, again, a recommendation not only from public safety but uh, from any of the appropriate departments. I'll recommend that we uh, approve this. Thank you. Uh, any discussion from council? Uh, Yes, I just wanted to say that my family and I participated last year and it was a fantastic event. It was um, very inspiring to hear some of the stories about Stephen Siller and other wounded and fallen heroes and I feel um, that it was an honor to support the cause and to, it was incredibly well organized and, and like to just give my support for them to continue here in Berkeley. We're lucky to have the event. Thank you, yes. Anything you would like to add? Anything that we need to know that maybe is different from previous years or? Yes, no, thank you so much. Um, my name is Tim Aiden. I'm one of the co-directors and new this year's uh, Christine Phillips and Orlando Vallejas. Uh, they're gonna be helping this year. We just wanna make the coming year a lot more bigger, just keep growing. Uh, last year in 2019, we raised about $60,000 for uh, wounded veterans and their families. Uh, we want, we've got big goals, we wanna double that. Um, get around 500 runners is what we want to look for. But what I want to tell you guys is we, um, two weeks after the run, we got the course uh, U.S. track and field certified, which puts us into the, like, the, we can get the serious runners to come out yeah. um, to qualify for their, you know, the runs that they want to do. But the good news is, is that anybody, any run in the city that uses that same route around Hurley Field and neighborhood can use it. I think it's good for... Uh, about five years, um, but oh. so just want you to know that other uh, other runs in the community can uh, use that. And you guys are just uh, an amazing partnership. Um, we go to a lot of um, conventions with the foundation in New York where various um, runs throughout the country come, and we're just so fortunate to, to partnership with you uh, just to make the run uh, that, that, that great. Um, and it's a really good, um, textbook run for the for the for the the national foundation just a really good community so thank you so much for all your support sure any other discussion or comments yes councilmember blanchard thank you Ryan. uh just a, a comment that uh as the nitpicker on a council that goes over all these yeah, events no, uh you've done a fabulous job on this everything looks good in fact i emailed you with a question yeah. and you got right back to me so uh and for all, everybody's knowledge they're planning ahead. This event is October 4th. Nice. Yeah. So uh, it gives us plenty of time to make sure we've got everything done correctly. So I appreciate that. So thank you. thanks for what you do. Thank you. Yes, Councilman. Uh, thank you, Ron. I'll, I'll share those sentiments. I appreciate um, you coming back and, and look forward to a terrific event. And given that this isn't until October and that you have everything kind of laid out, could you share a little bit about some of the um, reminder outreach that you'll be doing as we get a little closer? How will people know about it, registration, all that kind of good stuff? Maybe put a plug in for your website or whatever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Right now what we do is we will build a website and we'll have a talk right now. It'll probably be in a month or two uh, when that will go and it'll be at uh, tunnels to tunnel2towers.org with the, the number two. And then there's a list of the national runs in there and it'll be Berkeley. Uh, and then you'll be able to register um, really, really quickly and easily th that way. In the first part of the year, we really focus on sponsorship and going to the, the community, finding you know sponsors, uh, small businesses, large businesses, that uh, kind of thing. That's what we want to do first. And then uh, we usually, in the uh, July time frame, have a big, July around July 4th, a big <coughs> campaign to drive 
uh, runners, and there's usually a discount associated with the, the 4th of July for that. Uh, and then just recruiting um, volunteers organically. Uh, you can register online and to, to volunteer. Obviously, there's no cost to that, but it just gets us into the system so that we can uh, communicate. We have a group of about uh, 10 kind of key people that we all divvy up our um, jobs and tasks that we need to do. And uh, you know that, that group just keeps getting tighter and, and a little bit bigger, too. Um, of, of what we need to do and then working really closely uh, with you guys and the, and the, the Berkeley uh, Public Safety, um, you know, locking in. One thing too we are looking into is, you know, trying to have um, food this year, maybe trying to do that. That's a preliminary thing we're looking into. So <coughs> sponsorship in the beginning and then volunteering sort of in the middle and then the last couple months are just, you know, race day logistics. So. I don't know, do you guys have anything to add? Am I missing? Yeah, um, hi, I'm Orlando. Um, new, new to, not new to the uh, foundation, but new to the uh, co race directing. And uh, Tim actually brought me on to uh, help with the running community. So, um, one thing that the foundation does really well, I think, right now, is getting the word out about uh, why it exists and why it's important and, and all of that. But this is a running event, and we feel that the best way to support the foundation is to really engage with the running community. So. Uh, one of my focuses has been trying to really penetrate, uh, you know, kind of the forums, the blogs, and, uh, you know, the different places where runners are at to try to uh, drive, uh, you know, that community into, uh, into our race. So if we can effectively do that, um, you know, if, if anyone here is a runner, you know that there's <laughs> about 10 to 20, um, you know, kind of race sign-up type websites, right? So we're going to be all over that, uh, and we're looking to try to um, get as many enthusiastic people out to the event as possible because we really feel that that's the best way to support the foundation from an organic standpoint. Great. As a, uh, as a follow-up question, uh, you mentioned sponsorship. Uh, if you haven't already had the opportunity, perhaps outreach to the, our Chamber of Commerce. They're very active and being able to support things. They have month or regularly scheduled uh, chamber chats and things where it's, you know, people can get together and meet. And okay. You might be able to, to find some, uh, get some traction with, with some folks through, uh, through that friendly forum. That's a great idea. Great. Thank you. Thank great you so much. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to the event. Um, we're happy to have you here in Berkeley. Thank and you. welcome to the team. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the roll on M0820? Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. Uh, Ms. Mitchell, please read item number four on tonight's agenda. Motion number M920. Matter of authorizing the mayor to execute a third party specialized services operating assistance contract between SMART and the City of Berkeley for public transportation services primarily designed for senior citizens and persons who are handicapped. The contract period for this program is from October 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2020. Is there a motion to approve M0920? Motion to approve. Support of Council Member Price with support from Council Member Baker. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, your packet includes not only the contract itself, but also a memo from Parks and Recreation Director Teresa McCarlton um, calling attention to the, the date received because it, I know annually, annually this comes up, annually the SMART tends to be late on this. Um, so I just want to call attention to, uh, as the director did, to the date received uh, portion of the memo as well as the contract amount. Um, and the Teresa and her team do a fantastic job of yes. of making this project go a very long way in the city and making sure it's a fantastic service. Thank you, Teresa. Anything you'd like to add? Good evening. Uh, you see me twice a year for smart renewal <laughs> contracts, so I, I am kind of a broken record, but I'm happy to be about a program that is so successful and that means so much to a lot of our seniors. Uh, when Amanda was talking about the DIA, we use our own transportation to take them down there. We have used their programs as well, but. Um, you know, I mean, this, what we use our smart vehicles for is so important. It's the daily transportation to grocery stores. It's the daily transportation to doctor's offices, um, you know, to get their hair done. It's also trips. It's trips to go to lunch. It's trips to go see things downtown. It's, it's, it's all types of things. So it's definitely a program that we're happy to continue to run. Um, four years ago, we found out that we were getting a new smart vehicle, uh, for a lot of reasons that are not, uh, smarts uh 
smart's fault uh, that vehicle has been delayed for all communities but we are finally getting it we believe this spring so we're very excited about that our mechanic is also very excited about that <laughs> um, we have a van that uh, we are very much looking forward to replacing uh, with a new vehicle uh, we replaced our diesel a couple of years ago and it's been great for us and then we also have our 26 passenger so what these funds are for this amount has stayed the same this year as well as our community and municipal credits which went up just a small amount again uh, for seniors that live in the city of Berkeley they can call uh, up to one to two days in advance we usually ask for 48 hours um, but if it is a day in advance and we're able to get them on our schedule we will we schedule transportation every morning from 9 to 11 30 and then obviously um, we take seniors again our boundaries are 8 to 16 mile in Lasser to Dequinder so I'm happy to answer any questions but you guys see me hear the same thing right. twice a year <laughs> so that we can get these funds from SMART and then we continue to keep up our uh, obligation to SMART which is our weekly and quarterly and monthly reporting um, in order to continue to receive the funds that we do and we're incredibly grateful and they're a great partnership for the community. Good. Any discussion from council or comments? It's great to get free money. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Councilmember Hennon. Yeah, since they're um, four, late, four months late getting the contract to mm -hmm. us, I wonder if they'd mind if we spent four months to get it back to them. <laughs> There's, it's a big organization, you know, so it's, it's a big organization. Uh, it, but again, with municipal and community credits, they're usually running about a month behind, and specialized services, for some reason, is a couple months behind. But Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll on M0920? Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Dean? Yes. Ms. Mitchell, please read item number five on tonight's agenda. Motion number M1020, matter of authorizing Hubble, Roth, and Clark HRC for engineering design services related to the 2020-2021 <laughs> road improvement program at a cost not to exceed $65,234 from the Road Millage Fund, account number 313-938-821-000. Is there a motion to approve M1020? Motion to approve. Support. Motion approved by Council Member Blanchard with support from Council Member Gavin. Mr. Baumgarten. <clears throat> Thank you, ma'am. Your uh, packet includes a memo from Public Works Director Derek Schuler as well as the HRC breakdown of this, uh, the project. Uh, noting attention to the schedule for 2020 as well as the number of yellow dots on the map. Uh, you'll see that there's a very widespread across the community. Uh, we would, uh, lot, lots of our voters are going to see their dollars in work, at work uh, across the city. And we're really excited to get this project off the ground and get some, um, some literally some investment into the roads and the, the infrastructure. So, uh, but Derek's here as well as Eddie's image from HRC. Great. Good evening. Mr. Schuller. So we're, it's time. Uh, we had the successful uh, road millage back in late 2018, so we uh, finally have some funds to work with. So 2020 will be year number one for actual construction. And as we discussed in many of those public hearings and meetings back in 2018, many of you were a part of those meetings. Uh, the first step in the plan, what we've always talked about, is doing a comprehensive uh, citywide uh, full depth replacement program. We recognize the need for that. We are able to touch uh, hundreds of locations. I believe we've designated between 150 and 200 locations uh, already. So uh, that's going to be our first step is to do some of these uh, full depth permanent patches. And then in subsequent years, we'll look for you know full re road reconstructs, which we know uh, we need to do as well. But those projects are, are very expensive, as we all know. Uh, Harvard Reconstruction is a reminder uh, that half mile stretch uh, of road and water main was over $2 million, and, and we're generating just over a million per year uh, with this millage. So, just to put everybody kind of in context. Um, so, our initial thought was in the first year to do a comprehensive uh, road repair patching program, full depth. And uh, that's what we're going to do. We had HRC go out this summer and rate all of our roads, the PASER road rankings, which we, we were lucky enough to get a grant for. During the course of HRC's uh, driving and rating of all 50-some miles of road, we asked them to sort of note some locations for this particular job. So the technician that was involved, the engineer that was involved, noted those locations. And then he went back there uh, over the winter to get some 
more finite numbers, put some more estimates together. And in the course of doing that, we realized the scope, which wasn't a huge surprise. Uh, we didn't just have a million dollars worth of stops to make, but there was you know, really closer to $2 million worth of stops uh, to make as far as this patching is concerned. So it was our thought that uh, probably the best course of action at this point is to uh, do the same program in 2020 and 2021, uh, hopefully under the same bid, and, and do that work. So the first two years, we would be working on those you know, 150, 200 locations around the city of Berkeley. So before you tonight is the design proposal to, to get that out on the street and to bid out this project publicly, again, with the start of construction this summer. And then uh, we'll also be doing work in 2021 as well, uh, following suit. I'm happy to answer any questions. Councilmember Price. Combining those, doing one year after the other uh, with the bid process, does that save the city money um, to put it under one bid? We do, we do save some engineering dollars in, in doing that. And I, I do want to be clear that uh, HRC, we've, we've talked about this on a few occasions, we're going to write the contract such that, you know, if we have a, a not so positive experience with the contractor, we want the ability to not go into year two, obviously. But by the same token, we want to be able to lock in those prices. So we're going to word the contract to give us the flexibility to move into phase two, if you will. Uh, we won't have to go out a bid again. Again, as long as they meet their obligations in year one and we're comfortable with the quality and the results, then we would save some engineering dollars that way. Fantastic. Thank you. Councilmember Raker. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, your diligence in this. Obviously, those of us that um, need to get from point A to point B around here certainly recognize the need for, uh, for a lot of this stuff. As we get closer to construction time, um, what will be the general approach to communicating to the affected neighbors and nearby homes and things like that so that they um, are yes. excited rather than surprised? So, so we've <laughs> talked about a few approaches, and, and I think a mixed bag is probably the best approach as with anything. Uh, website, uh, we've talked about some sandwich boards. The uh, city manager has, has talked about that where we create some boards to put out uh, beforehand showing you know your tax dollars at work. I, I view the website again being that primary component as far as scope, schedule, contact phone, you know that sort of thing uh, similar to other infrastructure projects. Um, obviously the thing with, with road, if we're going to impact a driveway for instance, where somebody is not going to be able to use their driveway for a period of time because that possibility certainly exists. There needs to be some direct communication and we will be working with them directly on that issue. But I envision working with Tori, e-blast, uh, website, notification, we'll, we'll make sure folks know before we get there for sure. Yeah, that sounds great because then people can plan around it, especially as you kind of work through the schedule for when this will, you know, the sequence from one uh, street to the next. In case somebody has a family gathering or something, they can understand right. uh, how the parking might be affected by that. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Hennan. Yeah, a uh, few questions. I've had some people asking me, why are some of our worst roads, why are there not uh, dots on those, you know, generally <laughs> asphalt roads? Do you? Sure. And so, I think we recognize that some of our worst roads from a PASER ranking are some of our asphalt roads, uh, Wiltshire, Kenmore. There's a few that come to mind that are going to be at the top of the list when it comes to reconstructs. And we recognize that, again, those projects are going to be significantly more expensive, so those are going to be on that reconstruct list. So this portion of the project is more focused on the concrete streets and those full depth patches. And we'll look at those reconstructs uh, in the future because those are going to be bigger jobs. We'll have water funds contributing to those. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at a lot of things when it comes to what's the next road like a Harvard, what's going to be our next reconstruct. We're going to be looking at the PASER raking. We're going to be looking at water main breaks. We're going to be looking at lead services, which is the new thing for us now. Uh, we'll be reaching out to residents very soon about trying to get more information on lead services in the inventory. I envision all of those things coming together to produce sort of our next reconstruct, which will be one of those roads, Councilman, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a whole lot of dots on here, you know, about 150 <laughs> to 200 that you, do we think we're going to be able to get all of them? So. HRC ran the numbers, and so you know we'd like to believe that we're a little conservative. Obviously, it depends on the pricing that we see, but HRC and bidding projects can kind of take an estimate on what you're likely to see as far as unit prices to go. That will drive that factor, but we do believe that we're comfortably in place to meet these locations. 
I'd love to believe that we're going to come in under and be able to do even more in year two than we expected. You know, certainly that would be a great thing for us as well. The goal is to spend the money and spend it on the roads. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. How are we going to progress through this? We're going to block by block, north to south, east to west. Uh, is there a plan laid out to, to do that? We haven't, we haven't gotten that far yet, Councilman. Um, I imagine we'll try to break this out systematically um, as far as being in same locations uh, because the contractor's going to want to know that. They don't want to bounce around uh, with concrete either. So I imagine we'll tackle it on a, on a section by section basis, but those have not been determined as of yet. I know some of these roads are Look like they're practically going to be rebuilt. There's so many dots on some of them. <laughs> and the map is obviously yeah. condensed eight and a half by 11, so it's a, that's a little bit deceiving. Yeah. The point there is just to try to let people know how many locations there are. We're busy for a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone lose a phone underneath here? Cash? <laughs> it wasn't for me. I think, the, <laughs> I think the mayor was trying to conference in. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Can't get away from telemarketers anywhere. <laughs> Anyone else? Sorry, Derek. That's right. And Eddie, I don't want to come. I can't. Eddie, Eddie you want to chime in here? <laughs> I think what I missed. I think Derek's done a great job. Pretty much covered everything. Um, I guess just to touch on a little bit how we talked about this is a two-year program. Well, we want to set it up. Basically, the intent is that the city will award to one contractor for one contract for the two-year period. Although you're, what we'd recommend is you just authorize phase one first and say we will go through phase one. And once we're, you know, it's complete, we approve everything, everything looks good, and then provided everything works well with the contractor, and even if make sure there's enough funding left, you know, what, what we could say whatever we want in the proposal. Then at that time you would authorize phase two, and then they could begin that, you know, uh, the following year. So we will have that set up. So there is some flexibility there for the city. If there's mm -hmm. any issues along the way, that you can say that we're just going to rebid, you know, phase two at a, a later time. So thank you. Other than that, I think you pretty much covered everything really well. Thank you so much. Any any other comments or questions from council? Okay, great. Miss Mitchell, will you please call the roll on? M1020. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Dean? Yes. <laughs> and Ms. Mitchell, would you please read item number six on tonight's agenda? Resolution number R120, matter of approving a resolution of the Council of the City of Berkeley, Michigan, approving the marijuana business license application evaluation point system to be utilized in evaluating marijuana business license applications. Is there a motion to approve R0120? So moved. moved by Councilmember Hennon, support? Support. From Councilmember Baker. <coughs> As you are all aware, <laughs> this has been a topic of great discussion these past months. And we have one final section on the metric that's going to be discussed this evening. At the special meeting, council agreed that all other items on the metric were amenable to council, so our goal tonight is for council to discuss that item and vote on the resolution. The goal of this item is to ensure that we have the highest quality operators with safe, state-tested supply. It doesn't do us any good to have an operator that can't open or to have an operator that is not using state-certified supply, which cannot be verified um, if the supply only comes from caregivers. Council, our city attorney, public policy team will be making this decision. If you are a resident that has concerns for council, you are more than welcome to comment. But ha as has been our practice, if you are an applicant or representative of an applicant with recommendations that you suit your specific business plan, please respectfully refrain from making any comments this evening. Thank you. Mr. Baumgarten. Thank you, ma'am. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we had locked in um, basically 25 down through nine uh, at a previous meeting. So our focus turns now to the uh, section that has a total of 26, but specifically an item that has been proposed for 16 points in our uh, scoring matrix, uh, which essentially asks a applicant to demonstrate that they have a supply chain 
lined up uh, at the point when they are applying. So um, the intent here was to, to make sure that they could show that they were cert they were working with a state licensed um, cultivator, and that was what was going to that that product was what was ultimately going to be on the shelves um, per their business plan uh, when this retail operation opens. And so that is uh, that's the wording that we're driving at. We followed up with Laura. Laura said that yes, we could provide um, cultivation, the license number for a, a cultivating facility. Uh, our interpretation of this will be uh, that the, the grow facility, the cultivator, they will have been through the entirety of the state's process. They have received a license from the state. They won't be running parallel like with the licensee, uh, with a potential retailer, uh, you know, that we're, we're in the process of getting going because, uh, again, we want to make sure that when the day comes, uh, when the grand opening sign comes out, that there is product on the shelf. And so as a, at the point of application, uh, we're only simply asking an applicant to say, I'm working with this grower, here's his license number, here is his intent to supply me, uh, and that will be reflected in the application process. Okay, thank you. Ms. Schludo and Mr. Hill, what would you like to add? <coughs> I think Matt covered it perfectly. Okay. We're just here to answer any questions if you have them. Great. So I'd like to kick off um, this discussion and offer um, an amended version of in the document that we all have that is highlighted in yellow. Um, I would like to suggest that it, sh it could read, has a supply with, state licen with a state licensed cultivation facility. Period. So can you repeat that one more time, please? Has a supply with state with a state licensed cultivation facility. Yes. So since I sort of jumped in anyway. Do it. Um, so it says has a supply. So that, that means they could have more than one supply, only one of which needs to be state certified. Um, that's, that's how I would understand that language. If it says has a supply, that doesn't mean it has the only supply would be different, right? Or ensures that all supplies, right? You, words are important. And yes, all that fun no, stuff. they are. So perhaps has a supply with a state licensed cultivation facility with certification that adequate supply will be readily available for sales upon the anticipated opening date of the marijuana business. So, but you're saying yeah, I'm questioning that, that all supply because it could be. Yeah, well, I've got six and only one of them. You know, as long as one of them has a license, then I'm good. How would you like to see it? I'm just getting a feel. Was that our intent to say every th every supply must be state certified, or at least one needs to be state certified? I'm just curious what our intent is um, before we, because you know, then we could. It's easy to tweak the language to to meet the intent. Mm -hmm. uh, our intent again uh, was to to make sure that tw the p potential retailer would be working with a state licensed cultivation facility. Um, as far as the whole of the supply, a portion of the supply, um, our goal is to make sure an operator has, has gotten to the point where they're in their business planning process where they have um, contracted with the state licensed supplier and they'll be ready to open up the day of. Um, I'm not sure if that falls into a supplier or the supply or if um, we, we, it doesn't, I guess it would not have to be a, um, I guess they could note that we have this disagreement with this supplier um, with maybe alternatives as to how to supply if, say, we run out or the supplier is, uh, for some reason, not able to give the, the whole of the amount. Um, that's not uh, the scenario that which we discussed moving into this. Again, we, our intent was to make sure that um, they will be able to open the doors, we'll be able to keep product on the shelf, we'll be ready to go day of. Sure, thank you. And then the way I'm processing that, um, the language is written seems fine then, right? If we just want to ensure that the shelves aren't empty, uh, that they have at least one supplier that's state certified, and maybe they supplement that with others or, or whatever, this doesn't prohibit them from doing that. It's just as long as they have one uh, that's yeah. state certified. If we want to make it where every supplier must be state certified, then, then we could you know, tweak this to say, you know, 100% of the supply is, will be provided by a state certified cultivation facility, if, if that's our intent, too. I'm sorry, Dad, it looks like he wants to cut into you. Um, my question for staff, for the attorney, is is it possible for there to be a supplier that is not state certified? I mean, it wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be, you wouldn't necessarily get supplied directly from a state licensed cultivation facility. There are ways in which um, 
uh, other material can can be sold, but legally verified and tracked <coughs> through the state's metric system or through some of the, some of the other various means. Uh, there's again, there's a, essentially there's like an Amazon style purchasing. Um, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but it's, it's essentially it's Amazon for cannabis products. Uh, LeafLink uh, is, a, is a big one that's used where you can go in and you can purchase off of there. But even then, it, it's tracked through the metric system that the state has is making cannabis uh, owners utilize. So I, I don't know there is there is a state verification in for I think each of the supplies. Uh, I know there's some issues with potentially caregivers selling excess into the system, but uh, we want to make sure that at least the applicant intends to use a state license called cultivation facility for the bulk of its needs. If that answers the long way to get to a short question. I, I think uh, what the city manager said is correct. So then how will it read? <laughs> well, I mean, has, has council come around yet on the question, are you satisfied with um, part of or the majority of or do you want the um, supply to be exclusively from or I should say solely from um, the state licensed cultivation facility we're looking for direction then we can write it okay so how is council feeling about that I mean our, I believe when I first read this my thought was the intent was that supply would be coming from a, a state licensed cultivation facility. Councilman Brannon. I, I think the question we need to answer first is if we want any variant of this um, in the uh, criteria. Uh, I do not think it's appropriate. I just do not think it is something that as far out as they'll have to certify and then they still have to get site plan review and then they have to construct um, this is a this is a farm you know operation right. and things can um, impact supply um, supply is constrained there isn't a glut of this product on the legal market that people are going to hold it for these folks for months or years uh, I just do not think this is um, in any variant of it a uh, practical criteria uh, uh, to build on Mr. Hennon's point or Councilman Hammond's point um, th it's actually accurate that this would be true at the point of application and so the applicant certifies at the point of application this is who I intend to work with but as noted, timelines change, um, business, potential vendors could change, uh, but we want to make sure that an, an applicant is at least thought that far ahead. It, 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 it dovetails very well with uh, requirements to document, uh, you know, how they intend to supply it, which is a pass-fail item in our process. Okay. So this is essentially making sure that uh, not only do you have a supply chain written out in your business plan, but um, you have now a contact with a state licensed cultivation facility. Uh, so this is a way of an applicant can go above and beyond. But you're absolutely correct. Things could change in the months and potentially even up to a year uh, between point of application and the doors opening these facilities. Other discussion, questions? Well, my comment is, like I said, uh, this is a, a point in time in an application. Right. And I think anybody who's got a good business plan is going to have that in there. And all we're asking for is that if you've got a, a supply set up in your business plan that you are using a state <coughs> licensed facility. I think it's pretty simple. We, you can't say all, of, you know, if you've got a business plan, does it identify a state licensed facility that you're gonna use? And if so, okay. Shouldn't make it too complicated. Council Member Hannon. Yeah, and so part of what we're discussing is we have the parenthetical requires cultivation to submit affidavit affirming supply levels and and you're oh. discussing striking that correct yeah. yes yeah. yeah really for the Stand. reason that you identified council member hennon is how you know what does that do for us and how reliable is that so i think the, the by striking that uh, we make it very clear that our focus on uh, awarding or not rewarding these uh, criteria is at the point of application. Does this exist or 
does it not? Because mm -hmm. we can't, none of us have a, a crystal ball that will <laughs> be reliable enough to predict uh, what may happen uh, in in the future uh, that may or may not be within the applicant's control. Okay, then I think I am comfortable with this, um, that it does show that they are thinking it through. They aren't, um, uh, it isn't a provider that's um, playing the lottery. Let's see if we get the license and then we'll figure the details out later. Right. Anyone else? So uh, thank you. Uh, so back to the, the question I started with the A and all that stuff and then to the city attorney's point about just declare intent and they can figure out the wording. Um, I'm kind of going through like the Goldilocks thing in my head right now, right? You know, having just a, a bare minimum of at least one, but you could have many more. It feels like maybe that's a bit too cold. Uh, if you require exclusive or uniquely from, or you know, singularly from all, then boy, that feels like it might be a little bit too hot. So if we just kind of settle, I'm thinking in the middle, like a, a majority or a, you know, the majority of their uh, projected uh, inventory will come from a state certified, one or more state certified cultivators or whatever the word is. Um, it's kind of which way I'm leaning, but I could be, I could be swayed if you'd use a different fairy tale. Councilmember <laughs> Hannon. Uh, some of my um, my initial thought on that was we just don't know the market dynamics <clears throat> of of is there enough I think the statistic I read this just this morning from this month was 63 percent of the marijuana being provided is um, through caregivers um, I, I that was in the uh, article that was shared with all of us um, I think that is the percentage that was shared. Um, so, you know, if that's the case, it would be impossible for someone, possibly impossible for someone to get to a 50%, you know, mm. threshold, a majority threshold from a cultivation facility. Would there be a difference between state certified or licensed under Laura uh, distinction there? I mean, all of the supply needs to be regulated, yeah. right? So is there a... So um, it would all come through Laura, and even um, even caregivers are right. licensed through the state. Through that department. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Council Member Hannon. I think the key here is that we are just looking for that they have figured out where their product's going to come from. Correct. Yeah, and I agree with that. So, so maybe the the proposed language stands. I just kind of wanted to ensure what yeah, we said. The intent. A whatever you know that means could be one of many, and if that's what we're yeah, if that's where I, we're at. That's I think that's right. As as Mayor Pro Tem Dean stated, it will accomplish what we seem to be uh, landing at or landing on here. So I'm going to read it again, just so that we're all clear has a supply with a state licensed cultivation facility with certification that adequate supply will be readily available for sales upon the anticipated opening date of the marijuana business period. I thought we were striking. I thought we struck after, requires cultivation. After facility. Uh, oh, okay. Are we striking or is it just this sentence has a supply with a state licensed cultivation facility period that that's what i plan. thought you had that was your first response. okay yeah. done that's it has a supply with a state licensed cultivation facility any more discussion this doesn't limit us if we say a we don't need to say at least one state certified right, right. okay no i okay. i think it's fine as stated okay I don't know if we need to make a friendly motion, but I'm fine with that. Amendment. Awesome. Okay. Yes, I would entertain a friendly motion. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm fine with the, that change. With that, and I seconded last time. I'll Perfect. Second again. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, Mr. Baumgarten, are we? Have we missed anything? Are we good here? Is there anything else that we need to? Uh, just one item. As we move into the application process, which will be our next step, uh, we're, we're looking to get that out by the Valentine's Day and start accepting applications by the 16th of March. I do want to note, uh, I don't want to 
obviously changing the language that was froze at the previous meeting, but just want to note for the council's understanding uh, an interpretation of item number 17, uh, which states that at least one stakeholder is either a current property owner in Berkeley or is a current majority owner or stakeholder of an existing Berkeley business. Uh, we do anticipate a large number of our applicants to have purchase agreements with an existing property, but not have actually purchased the property itself. Um, so the, the way that we're going to interpret the language with the consent of the governing body here uh, would be that for this particular purpose, a, a purchase agreement uh, for to eventually purchase the property subject to a license being awarded to them would not meet this standard. Uh, they would actually have to have uh, ownership of this property to be awarded the 17 points uh, specific to the Berkeley property owner portion of this. Um, just want to make sure this note this as we move forward uh, as there is some ambiguity given the the number of months standard has been dropped whether it was four or six in the past uh, now it's right up to the date of and just want to note that uh, again administratively we'll be interpreting that as you have to have owned you have to own the property at the point of application uh, not just have an agreement to do so later pending uh, approval of the license okay uh, thank you. I'd, I'd support that. As I read the language, it seems very clear, right? Is uh, is either a current property owner? I mean, that's pretty clear. It doesn't mean I'm potentially going to be a property owner, but it's like, yep, I'm. I got. It's the real deal. So, I support that interpretation. Yeah. And I, I would just like to, I, I guess, clarify because the the alternative, which is generally what the city accepts for almost all other purposes, whether it's liquor licensing, applications for rezoning, uh, site plan approvals, or whatever, generally uh, it suffices when the applicant submits a purchase agreement, with or without a contingency, but a purchase agreement along with the concurrence of the legal property owner in the application usually that suffices for purposes of ownership um, and what we're talking about here is being more rigid oh. than that and requiring somebody to have an actual deed or 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 land contract in hand and not just a purchase agreement so i want to make sure council understands that distinction and that's where you want to end up because if we take the more rigid approach um, that will end up um, depriving, if you will, a lot of the potential applications we are going to have, uh, uh, will deprive them from receiving it, and will actually give an advantage of those who, um, who already own property in the city. And that's fine, but it's, um, we, we need to weigh that against what our ultimate mission is here or goal which is it to land on the most qualified applicant or is it to give some favorable attention or advantage to um, to people who already own property in Berkeley who I mean certainly that is that is a positive attribute but that does not necessarily land you at the most qualified applicant. You could have someone with virtually no experience uh, who owns property who will get the points, but somebody who is coming in new to the city with, with lots of experience and wherewithal and a plan and all that who would not get the points. So I just want to make sure in making this decision that you're weighing both sides of the the issue oh thank you honor yeah i uh, thank you for that additional <coughs> clarification I, I think that helps me be even more comfortable with this because certainly it's just one of the items on the list and maybe they'll do very well on some of the other items uh, if they for, forgo that uh, and also there's opportunities to partner right because uh, it says at least one stakeholder it doesn't mean you know all of them or anything like that so um, but thank you for that additional clarity councilman Rennan. yeah um that was my interpretation all along. Um, wasn't aware, of, so I remained comfortable <clears throat> with this. Wasn't aware of what sometimes legally can be considered differently. And I might suggest that we do add to that to 
perfectly clarify our position so that it isn't a point of future litigation. And I'm proposing adding um, purchase agreements or similar mechanisms do not count towards the majority ownership criteria. As of the date of the application. As of the date of the application, yeah. yeah. I'd love to hear the response from the city attorney on the language. Is there... Could you repeat it once yes. more, Councilman Hennon? Purchase agreements or similar mechanisms do not count towards the majority ownership criteria. I don't know if the, as of the date of the application was right. necessary it's, or not. It's the same for all of them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. And that would be a parenthetical? <coughs> parenthetical or an additional mm -hmm. okay. sentence, you know. I, I mean, I think that's fine. It clarifies the council's yeah, intent. intent. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm okay with that friendly addition to my. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Is everyone okay with that friendly addition to item number 17? Okay. All right. And said it with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, really, what we're you know, voting on is the first item of discussion, right? Um, item number six, because this document was frozen last time, except for the, you know, 26, the, the part in yellow. So that's the vote, right? Except now we've amended this. Right, so the, the resolution would be adopting the standard as amended this evening. Okay. Yep. We're good with that? Yes. Okay. Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the roll on R0120. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Dean? Yes. Ms. Mitchell, please read item number seven on tonight's agenda. Ordinance number 0320, matter of considering the first reading of a zoning ordinance of the City of Berkeley, Michigan, to amend sections 138-584, 138-605, 138-625, 138-656, and add new section 138-552 to chapter 138 zoning to establish requirements for public hearing notices. Is there a motion to approve M0320? So moved. Moved by Council Member Hennon. Support. With support from Council Member Price. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Your packet this evening includes not only the text of the ordinance itself, uh, but also a, uh, a memo from Mishluto, Community Development Director, outlining the work that's been done by the Planning Commission up to this point. Uh, and as a procedural note, this item has been advertised to the public for, for a period of one week and has been in the possession of council for a period of one week, satisfying the um, rules of procedure for the city council. So it is open for adoption if the council were to wish to do so, or open for a first reading if the council were wish to do so this evening. Okay, Ms. Sluto. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'd like to uh, reference my January 29th, 2020 letter. This is uh, very similar to the memo that I wrote to the Planning Commission, um, just with the uh, amendments noting uh, the decision of the Planning Commission at the required public hearing. Uh, that was held at the January 28th, 2020 meeting. Um, I went through and explained uh, the purpose of the proposed ordinances. Um, as you will note, uh, there are four, there are currently four sections. Um, I'm Yes, there are currently four sections in the zoning ordinance that codify the requirements for a public hearing notice. Um, sections 138-584, 138-605, 138-625, and 138-656. Granted, all four of these sections are exactly the same. Um, however, if there were to be any changes or alterations to one, it could um, it's highly feasible that one of those might be missed inadvertently. Therefore, I'm proposing to codify uh, a new section um, with these uh, requirements and um, in the ordinance regulations, proposed ordinance that I have drafted, I have also included um, a requirement that the 
uh, notice be published on the city website no less than 15 days prior to the public date of the public <laughs> hearing, as well as a temporary sign to be um, set up on the uh, subject property of the public hearing no less than seven days prior to the hearing date. We have been employing this um, policy and this procedure for quite some time now since I've uh, before it was started before I began and um, certainly been doing it in the interim. Um, we had a temporary sign that we had been using um, that just wasn't uh, fitting the bill for what we wanted to do and what we wanted to convey to the public. So we do have the permanent temporary signs, if you will. <laughs> um, I have those um, here for your um, for you to look at if you would like to and kind of see what we've been what we've been doing. Um, but this is the the procedure that we've been going forward with to make sure that we are uh, reaching as many people as possible um, notice with these public hearings. <coughs> Thank you. This just one. Uh, this will not um, eliminate or lessen the state mandated requirements that are laid out in the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. These are just additional um, steps that we are putting into place to ensure that um, residents that are within the general neighborhood of a subject property, but maybe 303 feet. Um, away from that subject property, and they don't get a, a mailed notice or didn't see it in the newspaper. This way they're aware of it, of what's going on in their neighborhood. Thank you. Mr. Baumgarten. I, I really wanted to note that Ms. Schluto has brought consistency to the, this practice, uh, has made improvements on the visibility as far as the, and, and uh, as you see, the, the content of the sign has really um, come a long way from what we're typically using. I think she's probably got a before and after to even show us. Um, <laughs> but uh, just, it, it, Yet another good example oh. of the positive improvements that Ms. Sluto has made to the department. That's the old. Yes. Yeah, that's definitely the old one. This that's before. Old. <laughs> that's before. This is, this is the old sign. So um, what it was is it looked just like this, very blank on the, and then it was taped with a piece of paper noting the date, the address, the request, the parcel number. As you can see, this one was subject to weather conditions that you know might prohibit someone from seeing it, and certainly um, not able to read from driving by. Um, <coughs> the new proposed or currently in effect signs are mm. double-sided, and these are um, specific to the Zoning Board of Appeals and Planning Commission. And thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So these state very clearly <laughs> that there is a public hearing on this property. It mentions the board in question, as well as um, a link to where they can find additional information. We've come um, with the help of Tori Mathis, our community, engage, uh, community engagement officer. Yes, I had that right. <laughs> um, we have created this page specific for this type of information, as well as the phone number and where they can find additional information or make phone calls <coughs> to the city if needed. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion from Council. Councilmember Baker. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is this is great. Uh, thank you for the uh, just a couple of quick thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, the signs. I like the uh, intent of those. They do seem to be a bit more durable. We're not always like taping up new things. It's just a straightforward thing. Um, I, it would be remiss as my uh, liaison to the technology committee if I didn't at least suggest that perhaps we add one of those QR code things and one of those little barcode things that you can zap with your cell phone. Uh, for the residents and neighbors who are walking by, they can just go boop and then it helps if you make that noise, by the way. Uh, yeah, uh, and then it takes you right to the website so they don't have to type oh. it down or take a picture of it and try to do it later. So just a minor suggestion. I don't know how many of those we've already printed up. Those are certainly fine and it appears that it serves the purpose. but. We can, I, I will absolutely there. make a note of that, and <laughs> as the signs maybe need to be replaced or updated, then we can absolutely sure. implement a, a And you might get additional that. feedback on those. My other question uh, wasn't directly related to signs, but the magic 300 feet thing. Mm -hmm. Is there um, is there a science behind that? Is, is there? It's a state law. State law says a minimum. <laughs> well, that's so exactly, I was going to see, and that's could why we go to four or five? What would be the disadvantage except for a couple extra stamps? To go to five. I mean, if there's been extensive dialogue, I don't want to like overturn stuff, but I just want to see if we're oh, three. Since we're working on this now, I was just curious if we could be intentional with ensuring that 300 really is the right number, as opposed to 302 or, you know, 400 or 500. Um, I just was curious what conversation has taken place about that magic well, number. Well, we hadn't had a, a discussion uh, either the state attorney or the city attorney myself um, about extending the 300 foot radius. 300 feet is what's mandated by the state, mm -hmm. um, and I, I personally, I think if you're going to increase it, then 401, 
501, you know, where we're going to have to have a cutoff at some point. Otherwise, right. we're going to right. notify the entire city every single time there's a public hearing Correct. by mail. And I think <coughs> um, with some of these public hearings there, because the city is so dense, we are reaching a large um, a large area with the 300 feet. Anything more than that, it, it takes up a lot of time, a lot of postage, things of that nature. I think 300 feet is a, is a good number for this size of community. Um, but again, we hadn't discussed it any further. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to say I'm certainly not looking to overturn conventional wisdom or if there, like I said, if there was a science behind it. But I know our intent was to go above and beyond. And so to do the state minimum doesn't feel like above and beyond to me. So it has been the standard not only in the current Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, but also in its predecessors that go back to the to like 1930. Uh, and it's been 300 feet. It has never changed, nor am I aware of any um, any effort to change it. It's just been accepted, maybe because nobody asked the question, but it's been accepted as the standard rule of thumb, if you will, for zoning approvals. I can speculate as to the theory behind it. I don't think there's any science. It's obviously somewhat arbitrary, but I believe the intent was that those are the folks who within 300 feet would be the ones who would perhaps be most concerned, most affected by whatever's going on with the premises, most familiar with it. And then when you start getting beyond that, um, then it's a, a far more generalized concern you know, really be citywide and not those most directly impacted. But again, whether whether uh, uh, people at 299, you know, 299 uh, foot radius are, are very concerned, but get the 301, they don't care. I mean, it, it th there is an element of arbitrariness, but, uh, and I think there's also some practicality too, because there is some work that goes in. And yeah, it's postage, but there is some, some work and identifying the properties and 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 so on and uh, yeah we could give direct notice to um, to everybody within our municipal boundaries um, but I guess the question would be we're we're increasing the administrative work and the postage but um, are we making our process any better or? Just more difficult, sure. and, I, and I don't know the answer. And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just to, to close out the thought, I certainly um, I don't mean to trivialize the nature of you know doing the, the radial search and like figuring out what houses are there. But it seems like if you're going to do it anyway, just yeah. making the arc a little bigger isn't that much harder, and I, it's a couple extra sheets of paper. I think and stuff, the, but the the thought is that we've had at least internally, administratively here, is the combination of all these things. The the direct personal notice to those within the 300 feet, uh, the newspaper advertisements, the uh, posting on the website, and, and of course the, the posting of the sign which will catch anybody walking or driving by. We think that the, um, um, the combination of those uh, should really be effective at reaching out to anyone who might be interested in providing input or in following the proceedings. I mean, I suppose we could even go so far as to, you know, knock on people's <laughs> doors, but again, at some point you have to do, um, you know, what seems to be reasonable and That's, practical. That, thank you, yeah, and, I, and I, I think I'm done with it. I just wanted to see if there was conversation as we're trying to go above and beyond to look at uh, that it's part of the equation. I certainly understand it's the long-standing precedence and uh, the plus there's word of mouth as well So if I'm at right. the 302 feet mark probably my I, I hopefully at least know my neighbor uh, a little bit closer to that And they might say hey, there's this thing going on. So I was just curious more about the process. Thank you Councilmember Price and I just wanted to clarify that it says that people within 300 feet must be notified but this doesn't limit the city from 
only notifying. No, that's, that's in correct. In the Citizens Engagement Advisory Committee, we're always talking about like what are the bare minimums we want to require in our communications plan. But then there's always for special projects, for something where more people we could tell would be affected because it would be changing traffic patterns yeah. or something else, we can always go above and beyond notifying or communicating more actively with more people. Sure. We that's just correct. aren't setting the standard that we must for every single situation. That is that correct, important? and this ordinance has drafted and proposed to you is a step in that direction to go above and beyond the minimum state mandated procedures. Right. Right. Thank you. Councilmember Hennon. Um, just some math trivia. If extending it um, 200 feet actually almost triples the area, so it is a significant uh, cost difference. You know it. Um, when I'd originally started thinking about these things years ago, um, my initial thought was just increase the radius, but I do like rather the signs, the website, um, those outreaches. Um, two, two things I would like to see, I don't think they need to be in the, uh, um, in the ordinance, a date on the sign um, so someone knows what day um, this is hearing and how much Oh, I've been procrastinating. I need to actually, you know, get my act together and do something now. Um, and uh, we had talked about this some, a plain English description. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of that specifically on the website. Uh, and uh, I know the attorney's fear was uh, if it is framed incorrectly, that that can become a point of litigation. So. Even just a disclaimer, this is just to help you, but you can't rely on this. <laughs> um, something, something like that. But for some people, you know, um, what does three feet, you know, encroaches three feet into a five foot setback mean? You know, it just means they want to build three feet closer to the property line than normal. And, you know, putting it in plain English for people so that they can understand better. Um, but also some boiler plant language that protects us legally. I think what we can do, you know, w with regard to the sign, um, we need to be careful about making it too busy unless we want to enlarge the sign. Um, and I've seen variations from one community to the next. A lot of communities don't put signs up at all. Uh, others do, and it's just real plain. Like it'll say, rezoning proposed, call. Mm -hmm. or info and just provide a number or or site plan pending call such and such for more information so it's 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 whatever you want it to do I would suggest is to Councilman Hennon's mm -hmm. concerns um, w with that the um, the actual written notice that we provide to the people within 300 feet um, that we make sure that we very closely adhere to the state law required language courts tend to construe it strictly but we can certainly supplement that I mean as long as we have the minimum in there we can add say another sentence that you know setback uh, variance requested for you know three foot encroachment this means <laughs> the, the, the applicant is seeking to um, uh, construct a building three feet closer to the lot line. I don't think there's any problem supplementing, which is really what we're talking about doing here. I just don't want to substitute something different than what the state is mandating. I, I agree with that. And, and I think <clears throat> not even necessarily do we need to do that in the printed public notices in the paper or in the mailed ones, but a link to that website. There you go. And then that can contain that information we can certainly do it and then that way. and then anyone without web access there will be a phone number that they can call to ask anyway I, I, would, I was just going to note from a from a process standpoint this is not an end point for us uh, the, the work of the community development director the work of our communication or our <laughs> CEO or our community engagement officer the work of the CEAC it continues the work of the TAC continues and so um, just being able to add something new but continue to uh, as, as I said earlier supplements continue to, to reach out more to people continue to, to find new and best practices uh, that's a process that 
I mean, even with even has moved past this. We're already sure. talking about certainly new ways of reaching people, and so um, I would wanted to note it with council that uh, we're not saying you know signs you know signs are in the ordinance. Right. All right, everybody go home. Uh, we do, we do continue to try to find new ways of reaching people and, and utilizing a lot of what was discussed here this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Gavin. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I guess my suggestion probably does not. Uh, need to end up in the, the version of the ordinance as well, uh, but it's more just kind of a suggestion as it uh, relates to the uh, mailing of the notice and also the publication of the notice. Uh, can we look to add some language that the documents actually associated with the public hearing uh, will not only be available for view on the city's website as we talked about, but hard copies placed in the uh, city hall as well? So the, I believe they do. Okay, currently. I didn't. Okay, yeah. I don't have one in front of me, but I, I believe so that they if, do reference yeah, that. That's mm -hmm. great. If they do, then that's wonderful. If they don't, then I would I would suggest that just in case we're trying to find some folks that maybe aren't, uh, uh, you know, on the internet. So right. Thank you. Yeah, Thank we. You. I I think we do that, and I think <laughs> we probably have one or more copies available at the library, mm -hmm. and, and you know, in place, places like that to 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 cover that for those who um, either don't have the uh, technology wherewithal or are they just like doing it the old-fashioned right. way as I do from <laughs> yeah. time to time where just <clears throat> print me a copy yeah <laughs> thank you thanks Councilman Rager. thank you uh, there's a question of clarification the intent of these signs is to be reused from one yes. project to the next until yes. the yes. physical state of the sign so putting a date on it might get us back into the notion of having to retape stuff so yes. uh, it puts all the more value on ensuring that that website's up to date right. and, and they could easily because if we have three of these things going on they have to figure out which one to look at and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff so um, I just want to clarify in my own mind the intent of the sign is to be reused until it, it is no more usable right and that's why they're um, specific for public excuse me for public hearings and they're not for any other um, business that would come before the Planning Commission such as just a straight site plan approval um, and they are specific to which board they're they're going before so zoning Board of Appeals versus Planning Commission um, that way to give um, someone who's driving by an interested uh, neighbor direction on where to look on the website and instead of just saying oh there's a public hearing well which one there's 17 of them I don't know um, this gives them a little bit more direction but if we were to incorporate a date that changes from year to year, then we get into a situation where we end up taping or writing on, on the signs, and then that kind of negates the, the prettiness. <laughs> <laughs> we're just the aesthetic. Corporate, the aesthetic. aesthetic we're trying to yeah. portray here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So we can somehow use Velcro. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Velcro doesn't rust. No. <laughs> okay, we good? Okay. Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the roll on, where are we, 0320. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Pennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Dean? Yes. Ms. Mitchell, please read item number eight on tonight's agenda. Ordinance number 0620, matter of considering the first reading of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Berkeley, Michigan, to conditionally rezone property described as lot 425 of the Vincetta Park subdivision from RM multiple family residential to parking district. Is there a motion to approve 00620? Motion to approve. Support. Okay, thank you. Motion to approve Blanchard and support from Councilmember Baker. Okay. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, well, thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor Bertem. Uh, just, again, noting this is a conditional rezoning. Uh, those conditions are outlined in your packet, uh, along with the uh, text of the ordinance itself that the council will be considering, and, but, and a very robust uh, email or a very robust memo from Community Development Director as well, outlining uh, really what's being requested here. Okay. Ms. Schluto. Yes, thank you. Hello again. Um, <laughs> I'd like to reference my January 29th, 2020 review letter. Um, this is very similar to the uh, review letter that I had compiled for the Planning Commission um, with some updates as to their, um, their review and public comment. Um, it, the required public hearing was held at the January 28th, 2020 meeting. Um, this is to conditionally rezone uh, 1256 Franklin from RM multiple family residential to parking. 
Um, if granted, the applicant is um, looking to pursue a marijuana business license. Um, they are interested in developing the properties on Woodward that are immediately adjacent to um, this subject property, and they would then uh, redevelop the subject par property itself for parking to support that marijuana business. <coughs> Um, several members of the public were present uh, and spoke during the public hearing with uh, split opinions as well as a couple of um, email correspondence that we had received uh, prior to the meeting. Um, there were concerns that the parking uh, development of a parking lot would uh, decrease property values to the adjacent properties and then there were others who spoke in favor of it because it would then support uh, businesses that are currently <coughs> located on Woodward that don't have um, sufficient parking. So I outlined the um, conditional rezoning request uh, in my review letter and um, the uh, <coughs> summary of the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, which per per permits uh, conditional rezoning as a practice. The applicant has provided a conditional rezoning agreement. Um, we've seen a couple of these in the, in the course of the last couple of months, um, and there's only one condition that the applicant has set forward. Um, it's noted in page two of the review letter. Uh, the rezoning designation as parking shall be contingent on the award of a marijuana provisioning center license to Yellowtail Ventures, Inc. by the city of Berkeley. If Yellowtail Ventures, Inc. is not awarded a marijuana provisioning center license within one year from the date of this agreement, the property shall revert to its former zoning designation as RM Multiple Family Residential. Uh, this agreement has been reviewed by the city attorney as well. Um, there are, let's see, there are five standards of review um, that are included in this uh, review packet. The Planning Commission voted by uh, a vote of six to two with one voting absent member uh, to recommend approval of the conditional rezoning uh, to parking. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Discussion from Council? <laughs> Council Member Hannon. Um, no questions if mr blanter did you have a question first or? Uh, i just have one uh this rezoning to parking does that uh, agree with our master plan uh it does the future land use designates this property as general commercial and service um to support those businesses that are currently located on woodward so um, our uh, future land use map um, does support this type of uh, land use okay thank you all right, so he did steal one of my items where I was going to <laughs> answer that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I did, I would rather this was just a normal rezoning request. Um, uh, I think from a planning perspective, though, that this property should be zoned uh, parking. It fits the context and it matches our future land um, plan. And so uh, I'll be supporting this. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your sh shepherding this through the process to get it to uh, to us tonight. I, I also will be supporting this. I do think it it fits the needed character of the the emerging Woodward corridor here, and uh, and it does seem to align with our plans. Uh, so, yep, this this sounds good. Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I, I would also like to say that uh, if this company does not get a license and this this reverts back to RM, I think this sends a message to other potential developers in the area that the council may look favorably on rezoning this to parking, mm -hmm. not under a condition, because we do need it as parking. It's parking all, all along there other than this one lot. Uh, but I understand the conditional because we don't want to disadvantage the, the owner of that and make it parking, and then he's got a residence on there. That's so right. uh, I think this, this will, if he doesn't get a license, it'll help incentivize some other developer to uh, look at that property. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the roll on, oh, oh, wait, oh sorry. The, the uh, applicant is here if you had oh. any questions that you would like to address to them. Anything? Uh, hi, my name is Chris Aiello. I'm the attorney on behalf of Yellowtail. If you have any questions, John? <laughs> I guess I'll ask one. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, do we happen to know if the property directly next to what um, you want to make the parking lot is for sale? To the south or to the northeast? To the north, northeast. It, 
is not for sale. No, okay. The, right. the uh, laundromat is not for sale. Okay, all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions for Mr. Ariello? Just want to clarify, is the applicant yellow tail or the property owner? Applicant is yellow tail. Okay. But the prop does the property owner support this as well? Oh yes, they're all here. He's actually oh. here and yes, he does support and I believe there's a contingent purchase agreement. Yes. And I think someone has identified the reason why this is being presented as a conditional rezoning right. instead of just conventional we had an extensive conversation about this at, uh, at Planning Commission is because <coughs> this proposal is an assemblage of of properties and um, I think the the uh, the owner of the duplex's willingness to um, to go along with this uh, is if the pending uh, sale goes through and if it doesn't go through probably would not want his duplex just zoned for for parking without being connected to any business that's actually generating that parking need so that's 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 why it's presented this way even though from the council's larger perspective you might look at it you know or more preferably to just see it as a straight up conventional rezoning but there is there is a reason for why they presented it the way they did a legitimate reason yes and and mr blanchard you've seen right through it you're absolutely right if you guys know if you've got if any of you know that corner mm -hmm. the two buildings that about woodward have zero on-site parking mm -hmm. so how in the world in the future will you ever um resolve that issue well we've brought it to the uh, forefront hopefully my client obtains a license if not Mr. Blanchard is right now the whole world knows there is an opportunity for a development inside of Berkeley that will beautify your community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we good? We're good. All right. Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the Thank roll you. on O0620. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. Ms. Mitchell, please read item number nine on tonight's agenda. Or Ordinance number 0720, matter of considering the first reading of an ordinance to add new Article 3 unsolicited written materials to Chapter 6 advertising of the City of Berkeley Code of Ordinances to regulate the leaving or placement of unsolicited written materials on private property. Is there a motion to approve 00720? So moved. Support. Moved by Council Member Hannon with support from Council Member Blanchard. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, ma'am. The uh, packet includes not only the text of the ordinance that's being proposed here this evening for first reading, but also a robust email or a robust memo from our city attorney, Mr. Sterren, outlining how and why this is able to come before the city council this evening. Uh, a little bit of context on this item. Uh, for a while, we have uh, received complaints about specific types of deliveries that happen through on, on weekends. Uh, basically, it's a, a bag full of mostly ads, but with some journalistic uh, endeavors uh, included with them as well. But essentially, you would have somebody who would just from a vehicle throw this onto lots. Um, and that's caused concerns and, and caused uh, heartache from, from various residents because it's just become, in their minds, uh, a nuisance to have to go in and basically clean up after uh, a newspaper company. Uh, for the longest period, uh, <laughs> any, though, any other uh, municipalities that tried to address this through various other ordinance means or, or through issues with state statute have run into problems. Uh, there's a court case out of Kentucky now that uh, gives us some leeway to potentially pass an ordinance to help us address these items. And, uh, Mr. Attorney, I know you've got well, some, some I think further that, items on this as well. I, I think that's right. Just briefly, not to uh, repeat or re restate, uh, this has been a, a, a difficult issue. We don't get a lot of complaints, but we get some, and the complaints we do receive, it's it's a very upsetting uh, uh, problem for people, and, um, and it's not unique to Berkeley. I mean, it's <laughs> everywhere that receives these 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 publications um, they they come unsolicited and they often just get thrown in the yard or on the driveway and you know there some people read them some people like me use them to to, to put beneath whatever I'm 
painting or polishing, uh, <laughs> and others just you know deposit it perhaps straight in the trash can. And for many years, um, there's been a body of case law out there that has really tied our hands, uh, basically holding this is um, this is First Amendment protected speech. It's not litter. It's not blight. Um, it's not a whole lot we can do about it. But as the city manager mentioned, uh, new development in that case law last year, um, the city of Lexington, Kentucky developed an ordinance very similar to the one before you tonight, um, which was upheld by the uh, United States Court of Appeals for Sixth Circuit. We happen to belong to the Sixth Circuit, so that's binding law in, in Michigan. Um, and basically upheld that like Lexington ordinance as a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction. So um, there are communities, I believe Dearborn has adopted an ordinance, Ferndale adopted an ordinance uh, very recently. Uh, I have crafted this ordinance for you, kind of modeled after the Ferndale and the Lexington, Kentucky ordinances because it has been an issue that's come before this this body in the past. Um, and what this ordinance will do, if adopted, will not ban or prohibit these deliveries, uh, but will control where they, they can be. They can't any longer just be thrown out onto the driveway or the yard. They basically have to be uh, placed and secured on the porch area or within a, a holder, a newspaper holder designed for this type of thing and just not left to be um, become blight or to, to be blown in the wind or to be washed into the, the drain or whatever. So that's what's presented to you. I did in my memo suggest that um, if council is inclined to, uh, to adopt this ordinance or for, for tonight's purposes accept it for first reading that uh, you know some additional thought will be needed to needs to be given to um, uh, making sure that we have the resources, the budget, and so on to actually uh, enforce it. And do we have the both the wherewithal and the appetite to enforce this type of thing? And then the other thing that I just um, suggested to you, cautioned you on, um, this will probably have a <coughs> significant impact on the publishers and distributors of those um, things and so some thought should also be given to how we roll that out and and present it to them both in terms of should the actual effective date or enforcement date be put down the road a little bit should we uh, um, should we make some type of direct reach out um, to these uh, um, publishers to both advise them of this so that they can do what they have also to invite them if they if if they have some additional ideas mm -hmm. as to how the how to make this work um, we have I, I realize I'm going on a little bit but I just want to share this with you I mean we we have in the past tried to address this problem through um, um, dealing directly with for instance the the publisher of the free press select which is one of the <laughs> the ones that usually is is what people complain about that comes in the pink wrapper and shows up mysteriously on your 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 driveway on uh, Saturday or Sunday mornings. Um, in many cases, they have offered to have a an, an opt out program, but um, it's been a mixed bag of results and success with that because. The success of such a, pro a program is probably less a function of who at the publisher is keeping this list and more a function of the uh, who is the driver who is right. driving down the street just tossing these things out the window and are they actually uh, looking at a list or are they just trying to get the route done and of course you might expect there's turnover with those people and you get different results so this is an effort to kind of ourselves set the controls as to how we want to see things done. So it just you just made a comment, the sentence of like tossing these out the window. How is it not litter then? Because it's 
It's free speech. Oh. It's got editorial comment and stuff in it that they these well but even commercial speech is protected but if you look at these closely mm -hmm. you will see that although they're chock full of advertisements there's always at least one page of actual news or or information or at least something that arguably fits in that category to protect <laughs> it from being con considered and characterized uh, is just strictly an advertisement. Okay, thank you. If you ask the free press, they will tell you it's a newspaper. It's not a circular. Okay. Any discussion from council, council member Gavin? Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'm certainly all for the aim of this, but you touched on kind of my biggest concern is in terms of enforceability. Um, you know, we talk a lot up here about code enforcement generally and making sure that we're enforcing it and um, so I'd, I'd like to learn a little bit more about that and how we can go about doing that because um, you know I, to, to create an ordinance just to in some ways make us feel a little bit better is not really going to help anybody. Councilmember Hennon. Um, I can't speak for staff on how they will enforce it. I can speak to how I've read on other communities enforcing this, um, and it is uh, if the paper is there, leave it where it sits, call the city, they come out, take a picture. This is how other cities have done it. They will take a picture and then issue the citations. Um, the laws this is modeled on and our law is every single paper that is improperly delivered is a violation and uh, the, well, the driver didn't listen to us is not a defense. <laughs> and so um, I think it would be very easy once there's a violation, there's probably going to be many violations. Those will rack up very quickly and I think the lesson will be learned quite rapidly. Um, my hope would be I hope with all in code enforcement issues is that um, they don't happen, but if they do, it's a, you know, it is swift and firm and uh, so that uh, the violators know um, we aren't uh, getting around and it gets done. Um, as far as thinking about the publishers and the effect that this will have on them, in this case, I have no sympathy, none at all. Um, I have called them myself, spoke with them, um, several of them at different levels, and promises on, yes, we're going to honor the opt-out requests. Um, yes, we, you know, we have all these technological solutions to make sure that they are, the opt-out requests are properly honored, and, you know, if you opt out, it's going to work, and it just has not worked. They have had, they have been given every opportunity and I think if they simply would have followed the opt-out requests, there would be no interest in this legislation. Or we can just get everybody a ring doorbell right. in, the, in the city. Councilmember <laughs> <laughs> Baker. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Thanks for, uh, for bringing this to, uh, to us tonight. I do support uh, this. I think it's good. Again, what it doesn't do is prohibit these things. What Sorry. it does do is just ensure um, the method in which they're delivered um, to the resident or homeowner, those kind of things. Maybe I'm a, an exception to the opt-out rule. Uh, many years ago at a council meeting, I brought one of those pink bags and shared the 800 number, and I had, must have been in my lucky day or something um, in that I haven't gotten one since. Uh, but I do, uh, and that was a long time ago, uh, but I do uh, think that this is, it's better to just protect the city and our residents rather than requiring everybody to have to call the the opt-out number anyway so um, I think this, this is a good idea um, and likewise I'm not too worried about um, um, the, the first violators of this because uh, uh, they'll yeah I agree they would they'll learn they'll learn real quick that that is the hope and we also expect at least initially that our enforcement will probably be complaint driven we'll get the mm -hmm. we'll get the complaint we'll go out and investigate I really don't anticipate that we're going to hire newspaper police to <laughs> go patrolling uh, uh, 
uh, the, the city at the crack of dawn every day, although we could, but <laughs> I would expect it will be complaint driven and then hopefully as, as, as Council Members Baker and Hennon have mentioned that um, once we make our point uh, we won't have to keep mm -hmm. making the point that we will eventually enforce compliance and then it will become um, a non-issue for us because the opt-out program, although it sounds like it should work, uh, we just haven't uh, enjoyed success with that approach and it continues to be a nuisance for a number of our residents. Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. I know that uh, I've been contacted by a number of residents who want something like this. One in particular uh, was quite angry because he sucked up one of those into a snowblower and did major damage to a snowblower, so he was not happy. So I know, and uh, when we had our special meeting that Thursday night, there was one in the audience that wanted to talk about that. So and there's, there's concern, and I think this is a good way to go about trying to get this problem solved. Thank you. Councilmember Hennon. I'll mention my own experience with the opt-out process. Did not, it, it would work for a while, but did not completely stop until I shared I sat on city council. Then that oh. seemed to be the <laughs> magic <laughs> words to get it to work. Uh, <laughs> nice. Anyone else? Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the roll on O0720? Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. Ms. Mitchell, please read item number 10 on tonight's agenda. Discussion, matter of discussing the status of the proposed Downtown Development Authority design guidelines and the proposed Overlay District Ordinance. Mr. Baumgarten. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you have before you a uh, well-written memo outlining sort of the current status and what has brought us to this point. Uh, if you recall a while back, the, uh, the DDA and the Planning Commission and the city all worked together on crafting a set of design guidelines that would help codify the, uh, the look and the feel that we would like to see for the aesthetic of our downtown area. Uh, the design guidelines uh, were produced, that process produced a fantastic document, uh, but then when the conversation turned to how to implement them, how to put them into effect, uh, we ran into some ro potential roadblocks. And um, since that point, we've had some changes in personnel, uh, we've had some um, changes in leadership at the, the DDA level, um, and we've just got a, we've got a great team right now that has had a chance to take a look at this and wants to make some recommendations to uh, how to improve the adoption ordinance and the ordinance outlining the design overlay district. Um, in order to do so, that would have to go back through a planning commission driven process um, with the planning commission working with the community development department as well as the DDA to uh, recraft how we want to see this implemented. Uh, some of those recommendations are outlined here with you in the memo this evening. Uh, we're joined by an absolutely star-studded cast this evening. Not only do we have Ms. Schluto still here from previous items, but uh, our Planning Commission Chair, Kristen Kapolanski, is here. Uh, our DDA Chair, Board Chair, uh, Andy Gilbert is here. I saw Andy there earlier. And our Main Street Design uh, Committee Chair, Matteo Pasolacqua, is here as well. So uh, you've got all facets of, of the three entities that would be um, really having a hand in making sure that the aesthetic that you feel when you enter Berkeley and, and new development and even redevelopment uh, really highlights that traditional Main Street that um, we'd like to see moving forward. That, that really just well capitalizes and, and well codifies the um, that kind of who we are as a as the, our front face to the world. Thank you, Ms. Sluto. Thank you. Good evening again. Um, so I'd like to reference my January 29th, 2020 memo. Um, there isn't too many um, items uh, that I've included here that um, haven't already been uh, mentioned by city manager um, at Baumgarten. Um, the only thing I want to uh, <coughs> kind of address is that us going back and trying to look at these with fresh eyes with the new personnel is not intended to hinder or delay any kind of development. We just want to make sure that um, we are identifying clarity with the city staff's roles and responsibilities, what we can um, ask of the applicants and making sure that um, it conforms to the design aesthetic that uh, we want here in Berkeley um, through the will of the Planning Commission and City Council. Um, so going over the uh, proposed uh, 
DDA design overlay district, there were five items that um, I noted that we should look at, and I've included those in the memo here. There have been some um, slight changes uh, based on some conversations that we've had with uh, over the past couple days uh, with council and with um, the Planning Commission chair. Uh, I don't necessarily want to get mired down into all of those um, this evening. This is more of a, a broad overview discussion of, of making sure that we're, we're moving forward in the right direction with these changes. Great. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I love this kind of stuff. I, I was curious if any of the folks from the DDA had any initial thoughts or comments. Again, not to get into wordsmithing the changes, but just you know, directionally or thematically, any suggestions or feedback or thumbs up sniffs uh, <laughs> from uh, from our folks here. Hi, I'm Theo Baslakwa. I sit on the DDA board. I just wanted to speak to say that, you know, <clears throat> in general, I support the design guideline process. I think it's one of the more notable accomplishments that the DDA has produced in the last year and a half. Um, in, and I think it complements planning well. I think that one of the challenges that, that the Planning Commission has is that they don't have a budget, whereas we do, so we were able to partner on this and kind of work together to develop something. In light of that and some of these proposed changes that you'll consider to how that's implemented and how that's reviewed, um, I would like to say that I, I do support the recommendation that we change in the report, the creation of another board to review and come up with a recommendation, I think that that I think in a much larger perfect world that might work, but for Berkeley, I think that that would actually be a hindrance to moving forward. But that I would recommend, and maybe it was the intent of the language that was provided, that <laughs> instead of soliciting the input of the DDA director, that the DDA, the DDA director and the community development director um, put a joint recommendation together to planning so that it's a kind of a 50-50 work together between the board and the community development director to then present planning with a unified recommendation that then planning can do, you know, what it so chooses to do with. Uh, but that was all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gilbert, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's anything else to really add I mean uh, the additional you know board I would don't think is necessary um, but to have the two departments to work together is perfect I don't Mateo said it perfectly okay great thank you Ms. Kapolanski anything you'd like to add um, just very briefly um, the Planning Commission is is happy to take a look at the language again and go through this in a little bit more detail <laughs> if that's something the council would like to do we're just very anxious to get the guidelines adopted so that we can put them into practice. Um, there's been a number of instances over the past couple months where they really would have come in handy. So however they, they are implement, implemented um, is fine. It's just a matter of how we, how we get there and how soon we can do it. Great. Thank you. Mr. Baumgarten. And the chair brings up a great point. Um, th these are, th no matter what the, how the work product is developed, whether it is continuation of the board or whether it's the community development, this goes to the Planning Commission, and the Planning Commission is the uh, the body that really handles it, yes. takes into practice in the site plan process. So I know there's previously concerns about this taking potentially being taken out of the hands of residents. Uh, that's absolutely not going to be the case. It, this still goes to Planning Commission, uh, who has the direct interface with the, uh, with, with, the, with an applicant through the site plan process or uh, whatever the application may be. Okay, thank you. Anything else from Council? Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, Director Shuto has got some excellent comments in here. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the next step is to take this document and merge it with what we've got before, come up with an, a new document that the Planning Commission should do for us that embodies all these things, such as removing the board. And I think everybody's in agreement with that. So I think that we're at a point now where we should just start moving this forward. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilmember Hannon. Yeah. Um, you know, one of my chief concerns was uh, that the guidelines would be mandatory, and I think some of them are too vague uh, to be mandatory, but I do want to give the Planning Commission some tools to be able to use them um, in some discretionary fashion. Um, I like the design guidelines themselves. Mm -hmm. they, they are very good. It was the ordinance that, you know, I had some <laughs> difficulty with. Um, I do think over time that uh, if there are parts of the guidelines that uh, we uh, really like and do want to make mandatory that we should tighten them up and then um, bring them into our zoning code uh, to make them permanent. Um, one question I had for Ms. Schutt 
Huto is, um, do we have any idea on the time and cost that it might add uh, for an applicant uh, that has to go through the uh, proposed review process? Well, the, the, the fee that I alluded to in my, uh, in my memo here was really if um, the design review board was going to continue to be the mechanism by which these, these plans were, were reviewed. Um, to have another board to get them all together, the administration cost, that's really what the, the fee was going to be uh, uh, reserved for. In, in light of the fact that we are not going to be <coughs> pursuing that uh, any longer, um, then the review fee would be eliminated and kind of getting into process a little bit here. The, the review board uh, component would be eliminated and the DDA director, uh, the chair, uh, whoever's acting on behalf of the DDA, myself would compo com be composed of like the review board as it will and then we would make a joint recommendation to, um, to the planning commission. Um, that's how uh, I've kind of foreseen things kind of moving moving forward in this direction. If there's any kind of um, discrepancy or uh, if there's a tie in, in any of these situations, um, I would recommend that like the building official would be the tiebreaker in that in those instances. But these would all be kind of taken um, be done administratively. That way there isn't a uh, review board meeting, then the planning commission meeting. There wouldn't be these uh, monthly delays for um, for w what might be a simple project, but we can get it done much faster. So to restate it, um, it doesn't sound like it would be any additional cost or additional time from the applicant's point of view. We're trying to eliminate that. Yes, right. streamline I think the process that if, a little bit easier. If I may, so. the intention is is being proposed here is to streamline the process so it fits <coughs> into the the current thing and will not be an additional layer of, of, of bureaucracy or, or, or delay for the applicant and as well as an opportunity for the city to, I guess, inject its thoughts and comments and feedback at a very early point, hopefully to help the um, developer design a, a product that will be consistent with those guidelines. So rather than be a delay or hindrance or additional cost item, if if done as we hope it will, it will actually do the opposite and will be a will 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 more efficiently reach a quality, <laughs> an approvable project more quickly. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And the recommendation like would be then to to the planning commission, who would then make the final decision. But we would. Um, we would be the ones to do more of the heavy lifting of reviewing these plans and making sure they comply with the DDA guidelines. Otherwise, a planning commission meeting could last a lot longer. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Any, anything else from anyone? Councilmember Price. So do I understand correctly that, oh, and thank you so much for the work on this, especially the um, recommendation to remove the, um, the design review board. I, I am absolutely in support of it. Do I understand correctly that you're interested in it being a joint report with you, the DDA director, <laughs> and the building official, that all three of you would make well, that recommendation to Planning Commission? It would be more um, the community development director, myself, uh, and the DDA director. We would act as the, the advisory, I guess, our own committee. I'm not sure how we'd want to phrase that. Okay. But if there were instances where um, we didn't see eye to eye and we needed a third neutral party, then we could bring in the building official to kind of act as that neutral third party if need be. I don't foresee that happening, but you know, it's there if we need it. Great. And then I guess my next question, I don't know if this is for a counselor or the city attorney, but do we need to provide an appeals process if the applicant um, is concerned with the decision of I think it would be the same vote. appeals process that applies now with respect to uh, various development approval site plan approval and and so on that uh, the ordinance <coughs> our zoning ordinance currently uh, provides for an appeal to the zoning board of appeals yes. so we think the there is an appeal process yes. but the uh, the existing process should work for this as well. Great. 
Thank this you. would really go hand in hand with the site plan approval process. So, so no different than when something like that happens. I make, I write a review letter, make a recommendation to planning commission, and this would be a component of that. So um, whether my recommendation would be to approve, approve with conditions, maybe postpone or table an item until some things could be worked out, mm -hmm. those would be things that we would try to work with the applicant to get to um, a position where they're their, their plan, their proposal could be approved without, without too many uh, modifications from the Planning Commission. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you so much, Ms. Schluto. We're moving on to communications. Ms. Mitchell, help uh, me out here. Council Member <coughs> All right. Um, recently, I attended some training at uh, SEMCOG on how to effectively communicate our needs to uh, our state legislatures. Um, it was a excellent class, and I highly recommend it if it's uh, ever offered again. So, uh, on the Zoning Board of Appeals, at their last meeting, they denied a request for uh, here's some of this uh, plain language <laughs> on two new homes on a lot spit split to be built closer than code allows um, but they in a second hearing they allowed a second floor addition that is closer than code allows and they allowed that um, because the first floor was already built um, before our current codes and closer so it was just going up and not really going out any further um, than before um, but I am pleased that that issue was discovered by our building official um, when he was uh, doing an inspection and he saw that they had violated the permit that they were they had applied for and immediately gave a stop work order uh, and that's why they came before the ZBA. So I'm very glad to see that process uh, working. Um, the ZBA also um, almost every member attended a recent training session at the county last week and I really want to thank them for their dedication in doing that and uh, their next meeting will be Monday February 10th at 7 p.m. at City Hall um, tree board uh, they are continuing their discussion on a public tree inventory and their meeting is Monday February 10th also 7 p.m. at the library uh, Tomorrow, Tuesday, February 4th, I have my Talk with Dennis event, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, at the library. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Gavin. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, well, for Planning Commission, we obviously <laughs> saw a few of their items here before us uh, tonight. So uh, the next uh, Planning Commission meeting will be at 7 p.m. Uh, on February 25th here in the Council Chambers at City Hall. Uh, the EA, the Environmental Advisory Committee met on the 23rd while our special meeting was actually in progress, so I wasn't able to go to that. Uh, but the next meeting will be on February 20th at 6.30 p.m. at Public Safety, the second floor conference room. Uh, in conjunction with that, the EAC, along with the uh, Public Library, will present a workshop uh, with MI Rain Barrel uh, for residents to purchase rain barrels at a discount, uh, $65. You must pre-order the rain barrel ahead of the event and you can pick it up there and get a tutorial about how to assemble it and installation, everything like that. Uh, you can go to mirainbarrel.com slash sign up. Uh, and the event itself will be uh, February 18th at si from 6.30 to 8 p.m. in the library. So that's Thank all I have. Thank you. Great. Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd just like to say that we had a very good uh, winter fest with very little winter. <laughs> uh, but uh, we had a lot of happy kids and they were running around and uh, decorating cookies and having a real good time so that was a success also I attended the uh, off to the races event put on by the Berkeley Education Foundation and uh, that was a, a good fundraiser for that organization and I thank all the volunteers that worked on both of those projects because uh, I know a lot of work was put into to both of them so and the other big event is, is a liaison to the chamber. We attended the chamber ribbon cutting at Green Lantern Pizza at 5.30 tonight. So the pizza place is open and it smells good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Councilmember Price? Yes, thank you. So um, thank you, Councilmember Baker, for sharing with me that a recent Gallup poll found that in 2019, Americans spent more of their leisure time at libraries than they did going to movie theaters, sporting events, museums, concerts, or casinos. 
thought that was oh. pretty exciting. Uh, the library uh, board met, and we find that circulation of books and all materials, but especially books, continues to grow at Berkeley Public Library. Um, there are robust programs for all ages. A couple of upcoming programs of interest on Tuesday, February 11th, at 6.30, there will be the History of Oakland County. Jim Craft of the Oakland County Historical Commission will deliver a talk about the 1877 book called The History of Oakland County and provide a cultural context for that book. You do need to register in advance for that uh, program. You can do that on the, the website or by calling the library. Um, Tuesday, February 18th at Rain Barrel Workshop, the uh, library is grateful for the Environmental Advisory Committee for partnering with them on that program. On Saturday, February 22nd, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., the Friends of the Library will be hosting a bake sale with all the proceeds going to support <laughs> library programs and events. They also organize the book sale, and they currently have a survey up on their Facebook page um, to get resident feedback on the book sale um, to continue to improve that program. I wanted to thank everyone for coming out and participating in my community conversation a few weeks ago at the library. I had a great conversation with uh, eight parents while their kids played in the newly renovated story time room. <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, the next community conversation, date and time still to be determined. It will be within the next month and it will be at the community center um, shortly following this senior fitness uh, class there. So geared more towards seniors, but as usual, residents of all ages are welcome. And then finally, I wanted to thank the Berkeley Schools and Royal Oak Schools for hosting an impactful day of service for um, in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Our community is stronger because of the education and service experience that that program provided, so thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Baker. Well, thank you, Your Honor. Just a couple quick notes as well. Our uh, Downtown Development Authority, DDA, uh, I'd like to uh, spotlight two of our board members, and uh, we saw two of them uh, here tonight. Uh, there's two others that I'd just like to give a quick shout out to. Uh, we have two student members uh, from Berkeley High that attend uh, the, uh, the board meetings and uh, participate in the conversations and, and do special projects. Maggie Gable and Eli Hurwitz. Um, good news for them is that they're graduating and will be moving on to the next stage of their uh, journey. Uh, bad news for the board, but it's also good news for the board because they'll be getting new students to, uh, to uh, participate. Uh, so an extra shout out to Maggie and Eli for, um, for all their contributions these last several years to the DDA and uh, for a, a really good write-up that they've put together about what the board is and the role of the student uh, member of the board and how they can be active members and help them shape and advance our downtown. So that's super cool. And for uh, more information on what's coming up in the downtown with events and activities, uh, please visit downtownberkeley.com. Our technology advisory committee uh, met with the historical committee uh, to propose and discuss some new technologies. So a lot of what the historical committee does is preserve and, and protect um, historical documents and photos and, and archival materials some of which are not uh, conveniently shaped uh, to fit on a conventional scanner. Uh, we have really old newspapers and old you know, blueprints and things that are, that are um, difficult to, to manipulate. So together those committees have put forth some recommendations about some more advanced technologies that are appropriate for, for museums and so uh, they will be going through um, a voting process to allocate funds from the um, museums uh, funds uh, to, to purchase some of that equipment. So I'm really pleased to see these committees working together and helping achieve uh, really cool objectives uh, for, uh, for that. Um, and as a nice segue to historical committee, um, I mentioned this last time, but it, now it's almost here. And what I'm speaking about, of course, is the, uh, the kit homes display. Mm -hmm. So uh, you may or may not know uh, that uh, back in the day, people could order a house from a Sears catalog. You know, you look through the catalog, well, that looks nice. Yeah, I'll order one of those. <laughs> and, uh, and have all these boxes delivered to your parcel, and you get to put them together. Um, Berkeley actually has one of the largest um, distribution or assemblage of these uh, kit homes. Uh, we have 54 of them uh, in the city. And you can see and learn about each of those 
right, uh, right over there in, in the museum, adjacent to our, uh, our, our council chambers here. Uh, there's photos of the, uh, of the home as it looks today, as well as the advertisement from the catalog of here's what it looked like and, and all that kind of cool stuff. And in some cases, we even have the, uh, the actual blueprints that came in the box. And, and it's a little bit more complicated than an IKEA kind of yeah. instruction <laughs> thing these days. You know, yeah, right. you know <laughs> insert wall A into <laughs> ceiling B. <laughs> not, not something quite like that. Um, but it's fascinating uh, to see that uh, that stuff is there. Uh, and we've gotten some great contributions from several collectors. Even uh, I met a fellow, before the meeting I was in the museum checking in on the progress and there's a, um, a very experienced uh, gentleman from Royal Oak that's uh, passionate about these things and he's contributed some of the additional archival material to, to supplement what we have. Um, now, uh, it will be, this display will be finished by this week's Wednesday, so just a couple of days from now. Uh, and you can come and see this for yourself uh, on most Sundays from 2 until 4 and Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And uh, finally, it was Patrick Young who once said, the trouble with weather forecasting is that it's right too often for us to ignore it and it's wrong too often for us to rely on it. <laughs> now, uh, yesterday was Groundhog's Day and uh, my understanding is the cute little critter did not see his shadow, which uh, foretells a, um, an early spring. Um, and so I just wanted to offer that uh, please be, uh, continue to be careful out there um, in these changing weather conditions. Uh, you know, it was 50 something degrees yesterday and I heard that people were out golfing. And later this week we're supposed to get snow again. So uh, it's uh, certainly, um, you know, these, this, this climate sure is changing here. And as we, uh, as we experience that, please continue to be safe, um, not only for your family, but for other families. Take care of your sidewalks, uh, take care of your driveways. Uh, people will do a lot of walking and our, and our canine friends too would certainly appreciate a safe path to travel. So uh, keep that in mind and stay safe and, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, certainly. Uh, City, City Hall will be closed uh, this Friday on the 7th for uh, staff training. We're actually doing an organization-wide training. It's part of our bi-monthly series that we've launched for 2020. Um, and we also got a chance recently to send two of our staff members to the Michigan Municipal Executives Annual Winter Conference. Uh, we also have trainings coming up at the Parks and Recreation Department as well as Department of Public Works. Uh, I say all that to thank this council for providing staff with the resources to, uh, and allow us to continue to invest in and making sure that our workforce here is not only one of the best in the, the area, uh, but professional, courteous, uh, emphasis on uh, public service, and then overall healthy as well. Uh, we couldn't do any of these things without the support that we get from this council and the resources that uh, you guys have given us. So it is, it's greatly appreciated and it's being put into effect. So uh, you'll see absolutely the fruits of the labor there. Um, and, and speaking of fruits of our labor, um, the recreation department did put together a fantastic winter fest. Uh, we, I was, the Baumgarten household was under quarantine still, <laughs> so we did not get to go. Um, but uh, it was great seeing the pictures, um, hearing the staff describe like all the new people that got to meet, and the, it, it continues to be one of our biggest events, uh, even topping Summerfest. Uh, so Teresa and her team does a fantastic job. Um, they actually were, many of them were away at a conference uh, learning how to continue to make uh, such a good thing better. So um, well done to that team as well. Uh, and then before the next time we meet again, uh, we'll have an election. Uh, and so if you have any questions about the election, feel free to reach out to the clerk's office. Uh, we are operating under new rules as passed by uh, last November. So there, if you have any questions, uh, not only is Victoria ready to go uh, to answer them in detail, but um, Gina Harold as well, our deputy clerk, extremely knowledgeable team, uh, will make sure that your voice is heard. Thank you. Mr. Steren. Uh, yes, just very quickly, I look forward to uh, attending this Friday the uh, annual winter conference of the State Bar of Michigan's uh, local government attorneys section. Uh, it's being held in, in Dearborn at the Henry Hotel, so it's a nice place. Um, they always have a very topical agenda um, and uh, Attorney, municipal attorneys, my peer group, come from you know across the state, so it's an excellent opportunity to discuss issues of common interest. And, and then, of course, my favorite part—they always put on a magnificent lunch buffet spread. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth worth the price, worth the registration fee, right there. 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're good. Um, so I am going to just jump on the Winterfest bang wanging for a moment, um, if I may. Um, in addition to everything that's been said, it was really nice to see council members Gavin and Hennon and Blanchard um, there as well. In addition to all the hard work from the Parks and Recreation Department, Teresa and her team, I also want to thank the sponsors because um, this is a free event for our community and I don't know if, if people know that. It was just so heartwarming to see all the families out enjoying all the activities. There were so many things to do, inside activities, outside activities, and I only got to go for a little bit because I work every Saturday, but it, I, it was really uplifting and um, it was great to see all the smiling faces and to see people actually out interacting with one another, families together. Um, so it, I really do love that event. It's, it's a lot of fun for the entire community. Um, also, Parks and Recreation um, is hosting a Parents' Night Out this Friday, February 7th from 6 to 10, I'm sorry, 6 to 9 p.m. for children ages 4 to 10. If you want more information on that or any other Parks and Rec activity, um, you can call the Parks and Rec Department or go online to berkeley.maxgalaxy.net. They are also hosting a vacation camp February 13th and 14th and 17th and 18th and register by calling Parks and Rec or berkeley.maxgalaxy.net. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn by Council Member Price. Support. Support from Council Member Hannon. Ms. Mitchell, will you please call the roll? Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Dean? Yes. The February 3rd, 2020 meeting of the 38th Council has been adjourned. Congratulations. Thanks.